Good evening, everybody. Um, this is another super Saturday that that we always call, and um, it's another time for uh, yet another wonderful session uh, of extra bites. And today is special for many reasons um, because one, obviously, what what we've done over a period of time, it was after a lot of disc internal discussions uh, for up. Uh, for almost 10 15 days when we finally uh, aired and streamed our first live session on 21st of april um, and uh, that was with yellow perfido and since then we have already done um, 51 um, live sessions of extra bites so 53 different photographers having come and joined us spoken about their journey as a photographer and inspired so many of us passionate photographers in India and all across. And today is special because, um, because I think some, so for the first time um, we have, uh, we are going to see a live walk through uh, the history um, of photography, so to say, and the man behind it is um, Aditya Arya sir himself. And he's going to share about his journey through photography and, um, and different stages of his uh, journey. And then uh, walk us live through the Museo Camera, which is the Museum of Photography. And if you don't know, I would strongly recommend that you go to that website and check out. And when, once the lockdown opens up and once the movement becomes normal, you should actually be uh, going there and walk and uh, looking at it and walking through that and visit, paying your visit physically. Um, I'll be putting the link um, in down in the description uh, of Museo Camera and, and all other relevant links. So today we have uh, on panel uh, again as Dinesh Khanna sir and uh, Samar Joda sir. So I will hand over to um, so Dinesh sir, but before I do that, welcome um, uh, Aditya sir and thank you for accepting the invite. Thank you. It's an honor uh, that you have uh, decided, accepted to speak on uh, Exploring Light Channel. Thank you, Jesse Ji. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you, Samar, for, for uh, uh, facilitating this. It's wonderful uh, what you're doing, Jesse. Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. A platform for photography. And uh, this is, as Dinesh was saying, it's, it's incredible uh, that the way Indian photography is being documented through this. Yes, yeah. And <clears throat> so over to you, Dinesh, sir. You can you can just take charge from here and. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Adi. Uh, thank you for agreeing to you know come out of his shell and uh, join the world of webinars. Uh, you are a man who lives in his mind, who lives in his plans, who lives in his concepts. And most importantly, as I've seen over the last more than a decade, lived in the dream of having a museum, which you have, which is just an absolutely amazing feat. The fact that you even thought of it and the fact that you made it happen. I mean, really hats off to you. And I've been privileged enough to be able to see that closely, both as a friend uh, and as a bystander. And uh, really the kind of energy you put into things which are, and I'm not kidding, 50 other people won't have the energy for. Uh, and I hope you will be talking about how this happened, how it came about, because just the very idea, just the very journey, just the very resolve is something which I think people would find very, very inspiring. And the fact that if they can get just a sense of what the museum is like, and they can then get down to see it physically and personally once the lockdown is open. I think that is what, uh, as far as I'm concerned, should be the idea of this particular talk and this walkthrough. 
Thank you. Uh, having said that, let me just read out uh, briefly, and I'll do that briefly because otherwise, Addy's uh, description for what he's done in his life would probably require a program on its own uh, because that's the kind of things he's done with his life. And uh, just to, you know, and he's known as a photographer, he's known as an archivist, he's also known now as a person who's a collector of cameras and photographic equipment. He's known as the owner of a museum, but not many people know that he's a farmer and a passionate environmentalist, which he pursues with as much passion and as much resolve as he's pursued his photography. So, you know, you can imagine he's probably lived five or six lifetimes within one ordinary life. So that's the kind of person we are looking at today. Uh, Aditya Arya, an eminent commercial and travel. I'm going to read this out. I don't want to miss out the important parts. All right. Uh, the important part, actually, I've already said, as far as I'm concerned. But now I'm going to tell you what his life has been really about. Uh, Aditya started professional photography in 1980. And he was, he was just telling Jesse and I that uh, it's, it's actually exactly 40 years since uh, July 1980. And so his professional career is 40 years old. So, Mubarak ho. Happy birthday. Thank you. To Aditya Arya, the photographer. Uh, he graduated in history from St. Stephen's College. Uh, I like the first part of the fact he did history, which is what actually, in a way, has influenced what he's done in his life thereafter. St. Stephen said, Chalo maak kya. Hai. <laughs> uh, He wears many hats. He's been a still photographer in the film industry in early 80s. And after a brief stint in the industry, he moved back to Delhi. In addition to his wide-ranging commercial and travel portfolio, his work has been published widely in books and travel magazines around the world. And I hope, Adi, you will talk about your earlier journeys on the Ganga and the books you've done with the Nagas. Uh, sure. Because it's, it's you know, according to you, but it's a very, very important part of what has become you today. And I hope you will share that with the audience today. Uh, he's led expeditions and treks of some of the leading travel outfitters in the 80s and 90s all over the Himalayas. So that is another aspect of his life which has not been talked about. He's been a travel person, a trekker. So you can add that to the various other feathers now. Over the last few years, he's been completely immersed in the subject and practice of photog photographic conservation. He has honed his skills and knowledge on preservation, restoration, and archiving and has played a pivotal role in the establishment of Indian Photo Archive Foundation and also the Neil Dongre Awards and Grants for Excellence in Photography, which is something which has been going on for the last is it six years or seven years of doing annual exhibitions of that. At present, he divides his time between his photography archive and Museo Camera, uh, which is the largest not-for-profit photography museum in Southeast Asia. I think he's being humble by saying that it probably is one of the largest in the world. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's for a fact. A unique partnership between India Photo Archive Foundation and the Municipal Corporation of Gurgaon, uh, which is one of the few thing, good things the Municipal Corporation of Gurgaon has done, uh, is one of a kind in India with 18,000 square feet of space dedicated to the art and historic history of photography. Really, hats off to MCG to understand that at least there's one good thing they've done about Gurgaon is to have the, you know, a world-class photography museum right here in Gurgaon. With more than 2,000 rare and iconic cameras and other equipment, this museum traces the history of photography from the 1870s to the digital era, which really means from the time photography was invented till the time we hold you know, our phone cameras and we shoot even without realizing that we are into photography all the time. Uh, and I hope he will talk about what is it that propelled him to do all this and how did he manage to collect, you know, what sounds like a figure, 2,000 cameras. Maybe with four cameras, I think I'm going to be a god. In today's fast-paced world of megapixels, he's also immersing himself in the slowness of analog processes and at the same time slowing down many born digital photographers and artists by mentoring them. That's another great thing which is happening at the museum. Uh, Aditya has also turned alchemist and artist practicing and teaching the art of vintage photographic processes such as salt prints, egg albumin prints, gum biochromate, and wet plate photography. And these are things which you can 
learn and practice at the museum once it's open again. There's a dark room there, and all these particular processes have been developed and are available to people under the mentorship of Aditya. Uh, he's been on the jury of the National Art Exhibition 2014, organized by the Lalit Kala Academy and many other national shows. And he's also created several shows and archival and contemporary visual works, both nationally and internationally. This includes the NGMA, New Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, the National Museum in Delhi, the Salar Ganj Museum, Hyderabad, and of course, galleries in Europe, Canada, and the US. Uh, he has been the guest faculty at the Shri, uh, at SACAC, which is the Shri Aurobindo Art uh, Center for Art and Communication, and also taught at Jamia. He also was a mentor at Habitat Photosphere, a photographic festival initiated by VG, VAG in the India Habitat Center, and is also the director at the Academy of Photographic Excellence he was, and that's where I had the good fortune of you know, working with him in running a photography school for a close on to four or five years. Uh, he's a guest fellow and curator of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla. I told you it's going to take a while for me to read through what all he's done. But I'm coming to the last sentence now. Aditya's passion for working with his hands extends to his farm, where he grows a range of pesticide-free vegetables and medicinal plants, and which neighbors like me, because I live in the same lane as him, can benefit from every winter because he gets all that vegetables and disperses them freely and generously to the entire neighborhood. Thank you, Aditya. Over to you for your story. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I keep saying life is too short. There is lots to be done. And, uh, you know, it's that's my story. I wish I had more time. I mean, uh, I don't know how people find time. I mean, I'm totally immersed in things which I want to do in life. And there are millions of things to be done in life. So let me uh, start with this conversation. Thank you, Jassi. And uh, hello, Samar. Hi. <laughs> hello, sir. Thank you. Please. Really, really looking forward to uh, hearing, especially uh, Aditya, you know, your starting years because, you know, uh, uh, before we even had the, you know, idea of contemporary photography, you were such a young person, you were like a kid and you just got on with it and you went all the way, film industry and advertising and travel and, you know, archiving. I mean, you've just been on every goalpost you can go to. And, uh, you know, I really want to hear, especially the starting years, you know. Well, <laughs> Chalo, I hope I don't disappoint you. And uh, let me start with... Uh... So is is that on the full screen, Jassi Ji? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So my yatra is a photographer. I the journey and um, so one second and uh, so it all started with this uh, Zeiss icon which my dad gave me in when I was seventeen year old and uh, it used to shoot uh, twelve images on one twenty mm roll and it was very fascinating and. By the time I finished college, 1980, so as I say, it's been exactly 40 years uh, because you finish around July and uh, that's when I entered the profession. Uh, I was 20 and uh, footloose and uh, uh, willing to do all kinds of things and I was shooting for magazines and travel magazines and uh, 1980 people hadn't heard about photography. So when I was asked in college, Ki, what do you want to do? So I said, the photography. They said, are you crazy? I mean, there are uh, uh, people take exams, civil service and join T-State. T-State was a very in thing to do those days uh, to join. And uh, civil service, of course, uh, anybody and everybody from St. Stephen's has to join civil service. And um, the... Management has wasn't, uh, I mean, people used to join companies, direct recruits, but I am so not really happening uh, so much. Uh, so I said, no, photography. And uh, it's crazy. I'm, I keep running into situations and I met some friends like Ravi Baswani and we used to do theater in Delhi. And uh, so they said, we are making a film. 
and uh, it's low budget it's an art film do you want to come to mumbai i said okay yes let me check it out so i caught the first train rajdhani to mumbai and there i was with some 200 rupees in my pocket with 200 rupees was pretty good those days um so i didn't even ask them what was the film and i landed up on the set the first day so i was explained the script and this is a very funny film and it's called jane bhi diyaro so except for nasir uh ravi ravi and i had done some theater and i was involved in a film called chashme badur as a still photographer which was shot in delhi too um so i said well doesn't matter but um, the script sounded very funny and every day there were issues uh, of course we never had enough money there was no money but what mattered was end of the day old monk bottle old monk used to cost 35 rupees and uh, and uh, so 35 rupees to buy the old monk hit uh, juhu beach go to prithvi theater sit with friends and uh, talk films so this was janu vidyaro uh, one of the funniest scenes from janu vidyaro um uh, mahabharat scene which is classic um vinod uh, vidu vinod chopra that's vidu vinod chopra in the he was also acting as an extra, uh, extra. he was one of uh, he was he was the production manager for the film that's nasiruddin shah so my job as a still photographer i loved it because it allowed me to understand the process of film making and the lighting and to be with the cameraman at the same time uh and my job was to take pictures as so uh, the film was being shot um uh, i was allowed only one roll uh 135 roll a day uh half of color and one of black and white why uh i don't know some of some of you may not believe jane vidyaro was shot had a budget of 6 lakhs that's all the film was made in 6 lakhs so you can imagine what kind of uh, budget we were working with so every day my job was i used to actually wind and uh, uh, spools of film from the raw stock which were left over from the films you know the raw stock which comes i used to respool the cassettes and that is how i used to shoot these stills because we never had money to buy the the original film um it was very interesting times i had access to uh some of the most well known actors and actresses uh, i ended up living with uh, uh sharing a room with the uh, anupam uh, kher and neena gupta was there too in the film and uh, we were all friends we were all from delhi um so these are some of those pictures from those days in 82 i decided i'm not meant for mumbai i'm from delhi and i loved the green space i loved the open space and mumbai was all about money uh there was a lot of money in commercial work there was a lot of commercial there was a lot of bollywood work happening uh so i never liked bollywood kind of work because the kind of cinema i worked with was art films uh chashme badu jane vidyaro mohan hoshi uh, mohan joshi hazir over with said mirza and couple of other productions so 82 one day i got a call that uh, national games is happening in delhi they are looking for photographers who are interested in sports now i said 
I used to do a lot of sports photography in college. What the heck? Let me try. I tried and I got a call. And uh, so it, that was one of the game changers. So I said, look, first flight back to Delhi. Um, I'm not going back to Mumbai. And uh, I, I left my bags also there and I told Anupam here, I said, you know, Anupam, I'll see when I can come back, but I'm going back. So I was back here shooting for uh, Asian Games in 1982. I was a cameraman. There were 19 of us who were hired. And uh, it was it was great experience shooting sports. And uh, uh, unfortunately, most of the work was, uh, we had to surrender all our roles and everything to the PIB every day. Nothing was given to us or uh, we were allowed to own it. So, but that was lost. But that helped me to come back to Delhi where I wanted to be. Uh, so Delhi had Delhi was the base and guard for all the travel magazines, Swagat, Namaskar, Destination India, uh, Discover India. And uh, there was nothing else which really existed because advertising there was hardly any advertising work in 1982. So I said, okay, let's work for the travel magazines. And uh, one of the first assignments, I, so I, the thing was, I used to create my own assignments. Um, I used to plan, I used to travel for good 200 to 300 days in a year. I used to travel very extensively all over. So I said, okay, I'm going to trace I'm going to do many assignments. One of them is going to be, I'm going to travel down the Ganges. I'm going to shoot. I'm going to do features. So I used, so for three, four years, I was traveling. I used to shoot travel features, sell pictures to the travel magazines, make some money, go back, do the next segment. So the whole year round, I was traveling. So it finally culminated on a book on Kanga. And this couple of images from that book, uh, this Naga Sadhu from uh, during the Kumbh. Again, uh, Banaras, Dinesh's favorite place. Kumbh. I mean, I look at this picture and I say, my God, we talk about social distancing. It can't <laughs> happen in our country. It's, it's impossible. Uh, there is a kumbh going to happen in January. Right? I mean, you know, can you imagine social distancing during kumbh? And they're already making preparations. I don't know how they plan to execute that. So my travels down the Ganges was spread over uh, almost four years uh, before the book was ready and it came out. Uh, this was during the monsoon times in Bihar when the river turns into an ocean. You can't see from one end to the other end. It's, it's impossible. And the waves and the, the depth, it's just so rough. Summer. This is Kanpur and Bithur during summer months where the river shrinks and the... Uh, uh, all the farmers move into these little, little islands and set up their Khireka and Tarbuj Khet. And this is a fantastic, uh, so it was a fantastic journey. It was about seeing the country. And uh, the most beautiful part of it was um, I was seeing the country. I was able to sell pictures, make a living. Um, you know, as a photographer, you can, you don't have to have an excuse to visit any place. You just go. And that was the beauty of this. And that's part of the reason why I was in this profession. And I'm still in, uh, I am, because it allows me to go anywhere and do anything. Uh, one of the kumbh days in Garmukteshwar, early morning, Uh, Bihar during the monsoon. Uh, you know, all this was shot on film. And uh, as many of my 
contemporaries from analog times will tell you how difficult it was to shoot on film firstly it was expensive and you there was no latitude for mistakes which uh, you know unlike a 32 gb card you can't just so we used to take one or two pictures that's it everything had to be perfect so you know you had to know this is my moment this is the decisive moment this is how i'm going to be so every picture was pre visualized conceived and created 1984 i somehow landed up in northeast and i said let me visit nagaland i had heard nagaland was a very dangerous place which it was because of insurgency uh, in 1984 uh, insurgency was at its peak and uh, it was very unsafe to go there i contacted few army uh, brigadiers and i went and met them i said this is what i want to do i want to visit there are 16 tribes in nagaland i said i would like to spend time so they said how long i said i don't have any time limit it could be months i have come here to live and uh, these guys were very shocked and i remember there was there was a there's a district called mon really up north uh, near burma border and arunachal and this this tribe called koniak and this guy is the chief of that tribe now those five little heads on his that uh, thing he thingy which he is wearing denotes the number of humans he personally has chopped these guys were head hunters and uh, i landed up right in middle of these head hunters uh, i had to communicate through interpreters which army was very kind enough to arrange for these guys were called dubashis so every village or every district had a dubashi means he can speak two languages so they connected me with these guys and i used so i could spend time and live there um uh, so that's ang of chui who was the head of koniak tribe a very deadly guy now typically that's his living room um didn't have elaborate this is mind you 84 i i had two small flash units i could work and uh, little flash uh, slave units um so like this picture so everything had to be improvised and that was the beauty of those days improvisation because we never had access to unlimited equipment so some of you may not uh, believe that for the first till 83 i used to work with just two lenses a normal lens and a 28 and the uh, rest of the lenses were added slowly zoom came sometime in uh, 85 or 86 zoom lens in those days was unheard of it was very expensive but see the whole beauty of photography was that uh, the discipline of learning how to so one had to actually master each lens so from 50 28 35 85 105 200 so one kind of a kept graduating and today also i don't require i mean i don't have to use a zoom i can say okay give me a 28 this is it because nothing like a block lens so and plus it was a great time to learn the art of lighting so one was because of restraint i couldn't afford elaborate lighting we didn't have lighting available in india the kitchen it used to be pitch dark and uh, so this is lit with uh, two flashes and uh, what is the idea of doing this uh, the idea is um times are changing and a photographer has a very important role to play which is a photographer is like a visual historian photographer actually documents the stories and mind you today this is one of the most important documentation of nagaland i have something like 5000 slides of those days and 5000 good slides this is 
these are the kind of huts where i live today you will not find a single hut like this it's all construction construction has taken over there are um, uh, tin roof houses this is it a typical naga village this is this this is iconic because uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you sir but but uh, uh, this kind of visuals are just impossible to even capture even if you want to because nothing is so raw uh, available anymore now i think everything is now concrete so jassi it's been um, um so my last trip happened in 91 and i didn't go back after 91 because of many reasons uh, partly because my advertising work had taken off in a big way and i didn't have time to spend months in nagaland which was my pet project and meanwhile the book came out in 92 today people ask me oh would you like to come for the hornbill festival <laughs> um it kind of pisses me <laughs> um, i shot these images when things were real when these people were real they were not set up for the tourist um uh, you know uh, as a travel photographer i was actually working living and documenting the lives of these people that's the ang of chui and he's sitting on his throne which is the elephant head and that's how he used to conduct his court and the red jacket was provided to him by the british when they left india uh, as a sign of honor and what he's wearing in his arms is uh, elephant uh, tusks you know hornbill feathers yeah. it's it's amazing nothing exists today this guy was a great head hunter this is his personal collection of human heads this was in his house uh, konyaks were known for their head hunting and uh, nothing they were so this village had few thousand human heads nothing exists i believe everything has been buried and done away with because uh various reasons between the church and the government said oh this is not a good thing to showcase to people but this is how his place used to look like that's ang of chui again look at the elaborate tattoos on his head on his face another konyak all these guys were great head hunters and this is how the evenings used to be spent now i attended lot of weird ceremonies lot of strange rituals one of the most important thing for them is the spirit of the tiger and they they are obsessed with the spirit of tiger so when i was there two tiger feast were actually held in front of me and tigers were killed chopped and cooked and consumed by the entire village the head goes to the chief the ang another tribe so finally it all culminated in a book called the the nagas and um, so meanwhile i i mean my work here had picked up and uh, one started getting lot of assignments but this is very interesting this came up the other day those days i was traveling so much that actually pudin harar did a campaign on me 
and said, uh, I've learned to fix cameras. I can fix anything on assignments. I've learned to fix cameras, improvise lights, uh, do without exposure meters, but what I can't do without is Pudina Ra. Uh, so, which was a fact of life because as a travel photographer, this was a very essential part of my kit. Uh, I didn't know where I was going to be eating, what I was going to be eating or where I was going to be next day. So slowly life changed and um, one started getting industrial assignments and um, there were a lot of big things happening in India all of a sudden in late 80s and uh, 90s. There, were, there was mining, there, was, uh, there were huge power plants being made. Uh, and how many photographers were there in this country? There were barely 200 of us who were doing this kind of work, advertising, industrial. And believe me, I'm a self-taught photographer. Uh, I didn't learn photography from anybody. I read books. Um, but one aspect of photography, one genre which I did learn from somebody is what I'll be showing you about, which is very special. So this is my industrial time. And um, these were challenges, which was so, I mean, they were so fascinating to spend time in the mines, in the, so in the factories, lighting up these with your little, little flashlights. And one figured out everything. And this, mind you, those days when things were still very primitive. So computers had just about started. So as I said, mines, I mean, I was traveling, shooting mines all over the country, uh, coal mines and open cast mines and uh, shaft, going down the shafts. So, you know, you know, one thing about photography is it opens up your mind to so many things, you know, I mean, today I can walk into any industry and say, okay, I know this, I know this whole process, how this is made. I've shot just about all kinds of plants and factories in the last 40 years. I have, so as far as my travel goes, uh, you'll be surprised, except for Mizoram, there is no state or a big town where I have not lived or worked in the last 40 years because assignments took me all over. And photography is all about problem solving. You're given very mundane things and made to told, uh, make it look interesting. Mines again, hot, humid, Difficult to breathe. That's a Tesco plant in Jamshedpur. Some modern plants were coming up too. And most of these plants were very dull and drab. So what was the job of the photographer to make them look interesting, to look, to, where were these pictures used? Uh, share issues, annual reports, things which don't exist today. That's a heap of mound of sulfur. Oh. Highly toxic. Uh, very interesting, difficult lighting situations in pharma industry, which was again very interesting. This is sugar coating going on. Uh, this is the coating of the tablets. Yeah, sugar coating going on. Yeah. And uh, so I've placed a light inside there uh, because this was just a steel uh, unit. Yeah. Which is nothing. I mean, so the idea was to make it look interesting and 
I think I've shot just about all the steel plants in India. You know, once that phase was over, another very interesting phase started. There were pro products being made and Daivu came to India and uh, Daivu launched uh, many cars. And uh, then over the next few years, I was shooting Daivu cars and Maruti cars. And uh, these were fun shoots because they were very elaborate, creating large soft boxes and working in large studios. Uh, I'd set up a studio in uh, Santnagar near East of Kailash. I used to, I used to call it Studio 9 because I used to typically work from 9 in the morning. So I used to be there at 8 in the morning, ready to shoot. And we used to work till 9, 9.30, 10 in the evening. And uh, it was fun working with controlled situations. So all that was uh, outdoor and creating, but this was a controlled situation. Now uh, that's a very interesting shoot, which I discovered the other day. Uh, many of you may not believe this. This is a set and this is a set which I had created in 93 or 92. Uh, Dinesh, uh, I'm still confused. I can't figure out which year it was, uh, but I would like everybody to make a guess. So the clouds and everything, this is a single shot transparency, no system work is not being touched because the system and Photoshop didn't really exist. This is how that picture was taken. Gosh, this is, this is crazy. This is 92 or 93. I, uh, it was like problem solving, creating the perfect light. And uh, Indian Airlines supplied me with the chairs and with the side panel. <laughs> and, uh, I hired a huge uh, space in Noida because this required a huge mammoth space and we couldn't afford to hire a studio. So everything was makeshift, everything was jugad, And uh, we got a perfect picture. Incredible, absolutely. Is you see, that, that's the way photography was done earlier. You had to plan for everything and do everything before the shot because there was no after. The yeah. moment you click the shutter, that was it. It was sealed, signed and delivered. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. I was just thinking and and uh, we, we guys, uh, and I am uh, included myself in that. We are... We are crybabies. We we crib a lot. We complain a lot. And uh, uh, though everything is at our disposal, um, and things are so easy now, and and look at this. This this is phenomenal. This this shows the kind of effort and energy that goes in. And you, there's no second shots, as you rightly said. Uh, and uh, this no, is no, and there's, there's no eraser. There's no enhancer. Nothing. Actually, what, what you're looking at is the 1980s and 90s ka Photoshop. That previous picture crazy. was you the architecture of that thing Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, and you know what I really love is, uh, you know, how Aditya, it's, you know, even the scaffolding is like a construction of bamboo yeah. Yeah. How yeah. It's, it's like an installation art. Hang yeah. yourself up there. <laughs> Brilliant. It's like installation art. <laughs> you know, summer, it was so, during the lockdown, I was able to dig into a lot of my hard drives, look at these images and which I had scanned few years back. And I said, my God, I did create this. And uh, today, uh, people talk about, okay, yeah, best basic, de do, baki hum, uh, now, <laughs> uh, yeah, the clouds could have been fixed. But see the beauty of the lighting. Yeah, yeah. How, Beautiful, so the light. natural. It, it, it looks as if actually the light is the is the sunlight, which is somehow uh, making us way through this window. Yeah, amazing. Because the guy is on the morning flight. That's right. So there were two briefs uh, given to me: an evening flight and uh, morning flight. Unfortunately, I don't have any work because of this. I have this was supposed to be an evening flight where the blue light was coming in. Uh, I was wondering, you know, what happened to that, yeah. 
so you know uh, it's just that i was i just picked up my uh, i used to carry one point and shoot and i shot some pictures for myself ki uh, just to remember ki how was this done uh, and uh, that's my friend uh, the art director ashok punjari from Nix, uh, from nexus who standing there checking the the last picture how it was done and uh, you know the, because uh, we could not afford to break this set we used to after clicking the picture i used to create four pictures and i still have these large format transparencies with me because i shot everything for myself too uh, it there was a runner who used to take the film to the lab in delhi and then bring it back to the location meanwhile uh, the lab used to call you up and say okay uh, technically oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you couldn't dismantle the set you couldn't move the lights oh, because yeah Yeah, and you live the life of uh, non-instant instant gratification. <laughs> you look at the screen every two seconds after we take a picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> These were another kind of images. I did a lot of work in uh, high altitude areas, Ladakh. This uh, is Pengong. This is Pengong. Now this is how this shot started. Oh. Getting up at two thirty-three in the morning before the sunrise. it was supposed to be so before the sunrise we were supposed to be ready oh my god it was almost uh, minus 10 minus 15 and it was damn cold and uh, it was month of october and uh, okay. uh, there was ice forming on the edges and uh, uh, we and i had uh, two small flashes this is how this image was lit and uh, executed but the whole production was fantastic i mean it was i like to solve problems so these were visual problems a uh, lot of high speed photography happened for various clients in uh, those days working and trying to figure out uh, for various juice companies soap companies and uh, i enjoyed doing all this work i mean it was fun and games i mean considering I've never done a job in my life. I'm sure that goes for summer also. Uh, Dinesh came from advertising, uh, but for me, this was one thing to do in life, which was photography. Uh, Mid eighties, operation uh, theater, first open heart surgeries. Wow. So this was then. I spent few years shooting open heart surgeries with Dr. Trehan in the. and and very uh, detailed when he was actually doing the stitching and things uh, because they wanted to create documentation and this was fantastic a lot of people were not willing and this had to be shot on film this is film days you couldn't afford to make mistake they couldn't keep calling you again and again for the same thing you had to be perfect so finally you know since we were we guys i mean analog was all about perfection uh i worked with avinash pasricha and i started my life in 1980 with him carrying his bags i learned the art of performing arts from him shooting performing arts and um, sometime in 87 one company approached me and they said uh, would you like to work in russia so i said sure then i went home and i found out russia was going through bad time I said, "What the hell?" They said, "You have to work for Bolshoi Theater, and uh, you'll have to stay there for 15 days, 20 days in Leningrad, Moscow, Tashkent." So for three years, I was going back and forth, shooting all the ca uh, catalogs for Bolshoi Theater, and it was fantastic. They used to stop the production and just perform for me for days. So I had to shoot each act of. So they used to. prepared say two productions and then over 10 days 15 days keep performing and i said okay let's stop here let's shoot or uh, i used to shoot them i used to carry my lights besides my food from here things were bad in russia those days uh, when i had to carry smuggle uh, dollars and uh, light stands and uh, <laughs> 
because uh, uh, you know nothing was allowed yeah amazing wow. unfortunately one has these brochures and catalogs from those days which one shot hundreds of them i mean um, i had my three years i had my fill of uh, uh, bolshoi uh, a lot of people say uh, bolshoi is coming to india do you want to see i said no i've seen the best i've i lived there with them another aspect of my work has been architecture because by 90s there were fascinating buildings being made uh, summer will know this building i've done extensive shooting here summer you know this this is this is in uh, the on the way to faridabad na these uh, the paul sisters uh, priya paul's uh, yeah, priya paul's place yeah, yeah. summer way you had your show that's right right yeah this is that building so i did a lot of work here uh, when it was made i beautiful building i've done a few shoots here too shot all their brochures catalogs now summer will know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i remember the exhibition yeah <laughs> you, you had a very good show there summer yeah that's why that uh, that anish manalish who arrived here yeah that's right mm. is again the same building wow and all this is film you know and uh, large format working with sinar yeah you know adit you need to speak here like where you were showing the buildings you know most people don't know what uh, color temperature is you know when you're working with mixed light yeah. and you, you you must talk about it i mean it's, you know we are fortunately in digital life which is much easier to handle but you know where you got cold light and warm light and cross filtering and all that so please do talk about that so you know there is sun coming in here you have uh, overhead lighting system the ambient lighting and the third light flash my flash by which i have created the general uh, lighting without disturbing the uh, the shadows and accentuating the that strong light which is coming from the windows so and so you know unlike the color balance uh, control on your uh, uh, camera of today you know we get to calculate okay um what is the predominant source of lighting here what am i going to create what is going to be so the picture was actually here before i click the press the shutter you know uh half the things were done here uh, so these were very difficult times with film and analog uh, where you had to calculate and of course uh, working with large format was a challenge uh dinesh's favorite uh, genre but uh, so is <laughs> mine because uh, uh for years i actually worked on food but the best part is that um i was never comfortable working with lot of food stylists i worked with chefs and i was my i used to say okay let's i'm going to tell you what i need is this is my lighting this is how i'm going to bring out the texture of the dish now you can feel the dhokla in this shot you can feel the chili so the whole idea was to work with chef because they are the best people uh they don't decorate they don't paint they create the actual look and feel you know like i was telling you the other day i learned by trying to read these pictures and deconstruct them and i'm not kidding that's the way i i learned my photography I should look at the work done by Aditya, Harde, Pradeep Das Gupta, Prabodha Das Gupta. That was my school. They were my mentors. They don't even know it. But my guru dakshin up pachad dunga ek din. अरे शाम हो गई है मजाक मत करो. 
So each shot was a challenge. And that's the beauty of photography. Every day is a new day. And photography is about constant learning. It's one profession where uh, Dinesh knows, Saman knows, I'm slightly allergic to the word mentor, mm -hmm. guru. Are yaar, photography is one profession where you never stop learning because each day is a new day and a new challenge. The day it gets repetitive and you have to shoot the same thing and again and again, you said, forget it, yaar. So when you go to, uh, uh, and it's, it's all about problem solving, when you go to the client and, and he says, yeah, I want to show, this is the name of my restaurant. This is uh, what I'll serve. But don't, just keep it subdued. I said, oh, simple, no issues. And uh, two seconds, the shot was there. As I say, it's all about lighting and texture. And you know, the thing is uh, with food, a lot of my clients know, I used to love going to the market to buy the props and the food. Um, all the shopkeepers in IN they knew me. They said, Are wo aage, yaar, wo e, pata nahi, das kilo. Uh, aur ek chota sa aur bolenge, <laughs> ye wala <chahiye> <laughs> so, uh, the resistance then later on I, they said ki yaar, inko de do andar se nikal ke lao because uh, ye chhaat chhaat ke, but initially there was a lot of resistance yaar, tum, puri, tumne bori hata di hai aur ab tumne ek chota sa tomato liya usme se ye kya ho kya raha hai aise chalo main kilo khareed leta hu chahiye mujhe ek hi that's it <laughs> Or the ka patta, the 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 top. I know that used to kill us. That used to kill us, but <laughs> the whole act of buying, being involved, and then actually I started growing these things at the farm for my food shoots, um, little salads and things and all because we kabi milte nahi the. I used to grow asparagus. I used to have half an acre of asparagus. Wow. This was a challenge. Uh, anybody who will know, to get the texture, to get this, to get the uh, to get the knife glowing, one had to place a, a reflector to create this whole thing. The sun is coming from the other side. Uh, I mean, this was a challenge. This shoot, but it was, and the butter had to be just right, melting. Can't look like oil. It can't yeah. be running, yeah. Uh, later on, um, I started fooling around with products and uh, art products and treating them uh, with my lighting, which was uh, fun and games because uh, that's what photography is all about. I mean, you have to enjoy the act of doing it. You cannot be saying, Ki yaar, uh, I know it's a bad period, lockdown, people don't know what to do, but these are the things to do, to fool around, to prepare. But these were complex lighting situations. You see, I've used around five lights, five elinchrome lights in this to light up this and to get the light through the leaves, to get the right textures on that stone slab. If somebody wants to study this picture, they can figure out there are five to six lights in this. So these were like um, self-driven exercises, which finally, ultimately, they culminated in a body of work. I mean, this is a very important part of what a photographer should be doing is uh, creating interesting body of work out of things they really like to do and which should be a challenge. And these things were challenge. I mean, I wanted the light to come through that vase and I wanted a 
top lid uh, so this is part 1 and uh, one second i'll uh, start with the part 2 of the we have it open on your desktop open sir there are there are some couple of interesting remarks on youtube by rita arya ji oh <laughs> so, <laughs> not so allowed I, i i must read all of them not allowed <laughs> <laughs> so one is that tell them you nearly passed out shooting the open heart surgery <laughs> <laughs> well because you know that i almost passed out today <laughs> and you need to give her credit for uh, yeah. helping with the props yeah they are they are give me credit for helping with props <laughs> <laughs> but the props used to end up in the kitchen after the shoot <laughs> she was helping and taking care of it no not get it wasted <laughs> <laughs> and also um, and in those days uh, you could trade anything for a couple of cigarettes <laughs> yeah we used to be all heavy smokers yeah? so in russia uh, when i was working so i made uh, so 88 89 90 or something like that i spent 3 years back and forth and uh, so this company i used to work for uh, so the standard thing was carry few hundred uh cigarette packs you know those uh sticks which used to come uh, triple five why a pack could buy me anything uh i could negotiate with the pack once i was able to stop a bus uh when it was so minus 10 in leningrad and uh, that bus driver uh, looked at the pack and uh, he asked my interpreter where does he want to go is there where he wants to go here yeah. he told everybody to get down and uh, my stuff was uh, shifted in the bus and he just turned around and uh, so a pack of cigarette was equivalent to 15 days of your salary those days you know things were so bad Uh, uh, a month salary was four packs of cigarettes so you can imagine how one used to work with the, in those circumstances so this is uh how i used to travel that van has is loaded with my lighting gear uh typically something like uh, 200 to 300 kgs and that's me in uh, egypt uh shooting mina house uh yeah. which is next to the giza and uh, so when i had to carry lighting those day uh because things like lighting wasn't available and these were month long assignments and uh, so a uh, simple shot and all this is mind you shot on large format as dinesh will tell you from the edges of this scan he can see which film it is right mm -hmm. so this is ectachrome you used to petrify me i never learned how to load 4x5 film myself uh -huh. i i actually bought extra holders so that i could send them to hardev ji's studio the night before or early morning so that they would you know load extra film for me because i refused to you know risk it myself i never i shot with the 4x5 camera for more than 10 15 years but never learned how to load it well i had uh, somehow mastered the art and um, so in you summer used to shoot a lot with that yeah yeah we used to carry that little fabric you know that little that black uh, <laughs> yeah. back. inside and the worst part was i think you know uh, aditya i'm i'm sure even the nation was that you know when you shooting in very very humid area 
you know, your hands are sweating in there and you're so scared. <laughs> you might just put that fingerprint on the film. Yeah. So it meant dealing with models. And uh, so I must confess, that's one thing which I didn't do. No fashion. Absolutely. I use models as props and uh, that's it. That's the end of it. No fashion photography was ever indulged in. And I still don't uh, do that. But I used models for shots for various situations. Uh, a very interesting shoot uh, for a property in Gulmarg where I've worked for many years. Uh, this is Khaybar. The beautiful shot, this one. Lovely, really. shot. lovely shot, yeah. To do a book on a commercial work, this should be the cover. <laughs> I think the airlines picture. Well, a front or back or na, do chahiye hote. So it's snowing outside, and uh, you have a uh, you know good twenty-eight degrees heated uh, pool inside. Interesting lighting situations, very complicated. Somebody may say, so today, uh, what I find, uh, my problem with today's uh, work is, most of it is available light here. We created all this. You know, there are something like um, eight or nine lights in this. I remember how, see the texture on the, on the, the towel, on the flower here, the shadow, the subtle shadow on the inside the bathtub. There is a light inside the toilet and there's a light which is streaming from inside, from outside. Again, similarly, it's, these are not found images. These are created images with a lot of lighting. This is something which I love to do wherever I go is create mood shots for the clients, uh, which they cannot think of. You say, okay, I can have a, a kind of a signature shot for you. Munar. So all this is part of my commercial work where you actually give the brief to yourself. And uh, I mean, the client calls you for a shoot and he says, this is my property. This is, uh, okay, rooms and things and all he can tell you, but the mood is something which you have to create. I still remember in Munar, I had to get up at, uh, around 4.30 in the morning to create this shot before the sunrise and uh, because I wanted to capture that and, and you know to mix the two light sources and make sure that everything is balanced and perfect. Actually, in a way, this is uh, the fact that you've been a travel photographer and you've done so much of that earlier. So that is an experience which you bring to this, which a lot of other normal food photographers, for instance, or hospitality photographers wouldn't even have thought of these shots. Yeah, I don't wait that's for... That's how photography and your, you know, in a way, your career is a continuum. It's not like little boxes. I mean, you don't uh, wait for the client to give you a brief and you say, yeah. let me create. I mean, this was, uh, this was a crazy day. It's, uh, the clouds and... Uh, uh, we couldn't shoot anything. So I said, wait, I, I have an idea. Let's create some mood shots. And um, uh, we just picked up some uh, random stuff and arranged it. Of course, this is a shot for the client. Hmm. 
again one of those mood shots <clears throat> A simple shot like this has something like 10 lights in it. If somebody was to look at it very carefully and it's done on large format, you can see the, the, the sprockets on the side and uh, oh, the exposure is perfect and how the light has been balanced on the light which is coming on the bed I mean, it's literally gliding. Yeah. So I love the challenges thrown by the clients. Key, you know, this is going to be a place like this and a lot of coordination. I said, no issues. Let's just do it. This is another interesting place I've been worked in. Uh, this is the same part of the series of Gulmurg. Uh, again, a lot of challenge here, mix, mixing light. And I typically don't believe in system work uh, because we come from analog uh, background where we actually, uh, sometimes we layered on the same picture. We shot twice, once for the external area, one for the internal area. And uh, we had one image. Again, you may think this is available light. Uh, no, this is not a very subtle. Uh, there aren't four or five lights in it. But the way you have, um, uh, we can feel that it is snowing outside. So the color temperature had to be maintained and balanced accordingly. I mean, you have to learn the art of yeah. lighting, which is the key to photography. Absolutely. And we come from the time when there was no post. So everything had to be done here. Wow. So I've been... Um, Going back and forth to Ladakh for since 1977 or 76. And uh, I used to climb, I used to trek. I was uh, leading expeditions for travel agents all over the world. And uh, these are some of the pictures from my Ladakh. So I've shot very extensively. Haven't had time to look back into these hundreds and thousands of slides and prints. Uh, that's me. Uh, this was a few years back. I decided to do the Zanskar. Gather trick. Yeah, Zanskar River. Zanskar. And uh, people said, oh, don't. It's like minus 28 and minus 25. Is minus 15 during the daytime. So I said, I don't care. I mean, you know, you're going to be 60 very soon. If you don't do it now, you, you're never going to do it. So I said, let's immediately do it. Uh, oh, this is Iceland. I was exploring. I was asking you when did you. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I climbed many glaciers there. Wow. A few years back. And uh, I trekked all over the glaciers and... Uh, Amazing. This is uh, again um, Sanskar. This is Chadar. Uh, this is Chadar. You can see the ice, uh, and this is very dicey because if it cracks, you go straight down. So, meanwhile, I was collecting cameras. <laughs> uh, was I, I, I was walking on the Chadar on the Sanskar, and I was collecting cameras. <laughs> 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 this was what was happening in my basement. <laughs> but I was also teaching the analog, the processes. And this is one of the workshops during the DPF. If you remember, Dinesh, yeah, uh, yeah. under the tree, we were teaching the, the Sinotype. 2015. Yes. DPF, yeah. And this is my 
other passion which is farming in a big way and uh, growing things so so now i'll go into something which has been uh, happening so there is uh, there is just one comment from anil l and i just remember you ditching us in srinagar in 1978 to uh, to make probably your first trip to gulmarg oh anil l uh, so that means uh, 78 he was trekking with me on margan pass and sinthan pass and uh, it started snowing on the sinthan pass in 78 and uh, we couldn't cross the sinthan pass and i decided to uh, head towards srinagar instead of going to kishtwar Uh, <laughs> you should know that. <laughs> uh, one second, let me share. Uh, And he has to say that you are a split personality. The moment you are showing your gardening thing, so he said split personality. <laughs> uh, uh, one second, where is my uh, Zoom gone? Uh, oh yes. so i have to share the screen and uh, so this is okay can you see yeah so this is 2008 finally when the world turned digital and uh, what happened was there was a gentleman whom i knew in 60s and 70s and uh, he died in 84 and he left many trunks with me and uh, said uh, in 84 when uh, i was already 4 years into photography and he was a family friend he was a photographer and he said you know when you ever get time uh, open these trunks and uh, in 2008 i had come back from ladakh and i said okay uh, let me just and my mom used to harass me a lot ki uh, dekh lo he left this with you 5, 25 years back and things and all you still haven't opened these trunks and so i said okay i know what is there there are some rare images of gandhi ji and things and all and so we used to have this uh, guest room on the second floor so the day i started opening it uh, this is what happened it started uh, this was his name kulwant roy he was a photojournalist in 1930s and uh, he left incredible num uh, amount of uh, negatives prints of entire freedom movement he had no family and he had somehow got to know me he knew my family way back in lahore in um, 20s and 30s and uh, i opened in 2008 this box and the first article came out in uh, Uh, New York Times uh, Global Edition, June eighteen, two thousand and eight. That in India, history in a yellow crate has been found, and they carried this whole story how rare these images are of freedom movement. And so, I had just opened few images, and Dinesh can tell you, I was just going nuts uh, sorting them out over the years. And then I set up my archive and set up the foundation, and I said. over the next few years i started opening these were thousands of boxes now if you can see what it says it says muslim league crips mission each box contained valuable negatives which actually are of great uh, historical significance because these images don't exist anywhere and uh, look at this gandhi ji crack negatives uh so he was preserving everything in boxes and so i documented the whole process as i was uh opening his archive look at this 1938 north west frontier to gandhi ji with khan abdul gawan ka with uh, dr khan sahib and three others north west frontier tour 1938 So you can imagine. And these are these are Kulwant Roy's own notes on each uh, on the road, right? So a lot of his work was annotated, but you can see how the over twenty five years 
the moisture had uh, seeped into the negatives mm-hmm. and destroyed lots so i had to stop my work and i started digitizing all this and uh, uh, his old contact sheets from 1940s and 50s when he visited kashmir 1962 mrs jacqueline kennedy wife of john kennedy us president of india ina indian national army so he had these rare prints and negatives of subhash chandra bose and uh, this is a classic example of an image which nobody in the world has not even the indian government this is the signing of the indian constitution the only surviving negative is with me oh uh, in fact uh, 10 years back the government approached me ki can you give us a copy of this and uh, so give them a copy this is sardar patel and uh, uh, all the people like amrit kaur signing the indian constitution gandhi and jinnah in an argument this is again a very rare picture ah uh, i started going into archives took out all the newspapers where his images were used and how they were used because i was creating an archive and creating an archive means creating stories and digging out more and information i spent a lot of time in the british library in london uh, i read all the microfilms of those days uh, looking for the newspapers where in 40s and 30s uh they were using his images so that i could pick up information as to where they were used and who were the characters in because a lot of time i had the print i couldn't figure out who so i used to go through the archives uh, the microfilms khan abdul ghaffar khan and uh, gandhi ji so this was the condition of the negatives a lot of time negatives had to be assembled because they had cracked reticulated typically how the boxes were muslim league daily session so this is really was, like a time capsule opening up this is amazing this is this is uh, what i found was there were just four or five photographers in those years who were documenting and his is the only collection from that time rest of the photographer like humai wahirawala and all came much later this is historic and no such historic archive actually exists he documented the making of bhakra nangal dam wow. all the early congress sessions he traveled all over the world wrote on uh, postcards to people and uh, once my archive became public people started sending me his postcards so today i have a collection of few hundred postcards which he wrote to many people he visited 50 countries uh, from uh, late 50s till 60s he published in all these magazines which are located so these were all his pictures in geographic magazine the cover and mind you this is 40s and 50s wow. so this nehru's picture there was no color photography uh, he used to hand paint them so i found the black and white also of this i think this is spanish but uh, it says kulvant roy so i i was constantly and this is a black and white image hand painted because he didn't have color film so he used to uh, show black used to and do white that hand, yeah he used to do it himself and send it and this is how, how <laughs> i think probably those magazines didn't realize that he was hand painting them amarnath yatra <laughs> so it says von kulwant roy and this is again 50s gosh oh, so how do i know these are hand painted because i have all the black and white negatives, negatives. Uh, 
<laughs> no, but what a marvelous job he's done. It's, what? Yeah, it it's is. It's so uh, real looking. It's fabulous. Yeah, it's so real looking. And for a person who is a photographer to have the time to sit and do such, you know, minute work. Wow. Wow. I remember my father used to touch a black and white prints himself. And it used to be, you know, very, very minute work. Yeah. It was an art. A collection of all kinds of brushes, you know, almost from a single hair onwards. So finally, all this culminated in a book called History in the Making, and uh, which is documents his entire life. This became a, a, a national uh, archive. Uh, and it's been to something like 11 countries. It's become part of the National Gallery of Modern Art and uh, it's been showcased. So I spent four or five years working on this project. And uh, another thing which it culminated was this, I self-published, this is collector's book, printed by myself on archival paper. And uh, this is how I was able to raise fund for my foundation and for doing archive. The first copy, um, so this book, we printed 200 copies. It has only 24 pages printed on annual paper. Uh, here, myself on the digital archival paper and we 200 copies uh, and each copy is numbered and we sold it for a lakh and a half per copy to create fund for this. So this is one of the first book of its kind. Uh, people do a lot of self-publishing on, uh, but this is unique. This is how this book is. These are some of the images. This is Bhakra Nanga. Very graphic images he created and uh, third class and Gandhiji stepping down and there was and this is this is exactly the way he shot it there is no you could not tell Gandhiji can you sir stop for a minute or do something no <laughs> guys used to plan an amazing shot and can anybody tell me what kind of camera was used this angle is a giveaway this angle is a giveaway. Twin reflex. Yes, it is a classic it's shot the, from uh, shot from the waist. Uh, shot from low down. Wait. Oh. So all this, this work from forties and fifties is so iconic. That was his camera, which he left. So he left his entire collection with me uh, when he died in eighty four, which also inspired me to carry on this whole uh, that's his Leica M3 totally working so slowly my collection started growing and I started picking up more cameras and uh, started picking up uh, all kind of ephemera and ads and uh, images so like that's an original egg albumin print from 1880s. So one ended up picking up a lot of this stuff on auctions from all over the world when they were coming up. So that's again an original egg albumin print from 1880s. Again an egg albumin print. I ended up picking up huge amount of stereos. Very classic collection, people of India. I'll be showing you this in the museum. These are original prints from 1860. I picked up a few hundred of these from auctions. Well, this is how photography was launched to the world. You press the button, we do the rest in 1880 when uh, Kodak launched their brownie camera. So albums, I started picking up old albums and uh, because these albums contained original images, egg albumin prints. Fashion albums. So 
that's the story of the archive and now we will go into uh, the the museum tour if you give me 2 minutes and uh, just, uh, if you can have an internal discussion for 2 minutes <laughs> this was this was uh, priceless i don't know i don't have words and and so uh, something like this nobody has nobody has seen and i think youtube is also buzzing with with uh, similar thoughts phenomenal. So Jesse, that's the point I was making in the introduction. You know, that is one thing to say, I'm a photographer. It's one thing to say, I want to take pictures. It's one thing to say, I want to make a living out of it. It's one thing to say, I want to be successful. You know, but it's quite another to be able to, you know, the archive is not just an archive or a collection of images. It's, it's, a, it's a history of a nation. Yeah, you know, and what, and what uh, Adi was saying in part of his uh, presentation, and we've discussed this quite a bit, you know, I've discussed with Summer also, is that each of us, if we're shooting regularly and we're shooting uh, on the street or shooting culturally, and if we're shooting mindfully, and that is very important, what you're doing is you're creating a visual history of your times. Like we're sitting right now and, you know, gaping at these photographs, which is shot in the 30s and the 40s and the 1800s. 50 years later, 60 years later, 100 years later, hopefully someone will be looking at what we shot. So yeah. there are two things. One, to mindfully shoot now. Two, and which is one of the reasons why I wanted Daddy to also talk about the archive, is to keep those pictures in a way that later generations are able to refer back and they know what they're referring to. Right. And right. which right. is one of the questions I want to ask him that, that what he wants to plan to do with the archive. Because unfortunately in India, there is no professional or systematic way of keeping photographers work in an accessible way. Absolutely. Or like I was talking to you and Summer earlier, it's, yes. you know, what is happening with the talks in the lockdown period is at least in terms of videos about photographers talking about the work and sharing the work that is getting created. So there is, there's a, that's a very, very important reference point, which has been made, which is there now. Right. 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 Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's not just about, you know, summer's journey or, you know, Aditya's journey or Jesse's journey. It is a nation's journey. It's, it's a, you know, the, the ramifications are huge. One has to have to, think large enough to be able to understand what the hell is going on. Absolutely. And, and I was thinking yesterday after our, our uh, telephonic call, um, I was also thinking that uh, uh, what is the importance of history of photography in, in our lives? And uh, if you have to break away from photography also, what is the importance of history? Um, it might not, young people might not feel that their life is getting impacted adversely if they don't know the history, but, um, but certainly their life will be enriched Remarkable. and, and cherished once yeah, they to... know the history. So it's going to be a different life altogether once they understand we the historical video? background, how how Where is the sound? Their, I can't I hear myself. Predecessors in photography have have done such fabulous work. It, it's been an eye-opening session already. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So we got visual. We got. We can hear you both. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Hear sir. you, and we can see you. Okay. So I can't see you because now I'm behind the camera and uh, so um, this is one of the most essential part of the museum which is camera obscura. So we are going to enter inside the camera obscura because history of photography has a lot to do with camera obscura and because the word camera is derived from or you can say camera which is room and what was camera obscura so camera obscura is an ancient optical device the name of which comes from the latin word dark room and uh, you'll be surprised that 
some of the most famous painters of renaissance are believed to have used the technology behind the camera obscura to bring perspective into their paintings the masterpiece girl with the pearl earring by john vermeer used the technique with a primitive lens which produced halation so this image so one of the most famous image from uh, created by john vermeer was used creating camera obscura and uh, in 16th century a lot of painters actually used to sketch so camera obscura was a sketching device so this is a prototype and typically what was uh, the what the painters did was they placed uh, their uh, uh, canvas and they sketched and then they, they they used to fill colors and you'll be surprised leonardo da vinci talked about it in 1502 so as we enter the museum this wall is dedicated to the four most important inventors of photography lesser names who created the world's first image a french man who created this image using camera obscura it was an 8 hour long exposure and then louis de gior who created the world's first permanent beautiful image and so these images this was known as daguerreotype so this is an original daguerreotype these were small they were kept in small cases they were very delicate and they used to take very long to get exposed and it was a very complicated process and these were uh so we have lots of daguerreotypes here uh, john frederick william herschel the guy who gave the name photography to photography he is the guy who actually invented many processes and uh, one of them is uh, cyanotypes and uh, these are some of the original cyanotypes done by the first photographer anna atkins in 1850s 1860s of british algae these are uh, copies of those and that process was actually created by william herschel he discovered anthotypes cyanotypes he gave the word photography to photography writing with light his friend william henry fox talbot created the world's first negative and the uh, because the problem with daguerreotype was daguerreotype was one off it could not be replicated so talbot created the idea and the technology behind the negative so this wall actually traces the history of photography and uh, what we've done is 1835 so we've done all the landmarks we've created uh, who did what uh, who produced uh, what process and also accompanying this is original uh, lot of interesting things and these are all original prints samuel bon 1875 the first studio in india lenses from that period my goodness these are dalmier lenses which are known
So besides the inventions, the processes, and what was happening in the field of art, like 1920s surrealism. So to help photographers understand the connection between technology, art, I do if you're speaking, we've lost your voice, sir. Huh? Uh, no, one second. Yeah, now we can hear you. So that's an original uh, daguerreotype camera with daguerreotype images. This is one of our earliest artifact. Is camera lucida. And this is what helped Talbot come to the idea of creating a negative. This is from 1850, this original camera lucida. So what does a museum like this do? It helps people understand technology and how it evolved. It's very important for uh, photographers, for artists to understand the role of technology and uh, photography. Absolutely. Because, because technology contributed so much to this art form. Each camera played a very significant role and it changed the way people actually created images. Uh, from these large studio cameras to smaller cameras by Thornton Pickard in 1904. That's a studio camera from uh, 1880s actually. So we uh, another studio camera, Watson. From 1885. Oh. Actually, what I think uh, most photographers don't realize is that, you know, when you talk about the history of photography, it's also the technology of photography, because I don't think any other art form has been influenced as much in terms of how it's created as photography has been. I mean, you know, dance or music have not been affected to that extent as this has been? So, these are some very interesting images from a project called People of India. These are original, original egg albumin prints from 1860s. Uh, this is part of an eight volume publication which was compiled by John Fox Watson and uh, John William Kay between 1868 and 1875. So this was like a personal pet project of Lord and Lady Canning. They were very interested in taking back home images of natives. And uh, each page, each picture is an original egg albumin print. And uh, it mentions grain dealers, Hindus, Sindh. Uh, so this is one of the first interesting, uh, very historic body of work, uh, which has uh, great significance because uh, in portraiture, uh, how they were creating these images using these large cameras and uh, uh, glass plates. This was all a wet collodion process. So this is typically what uh, a glass plate looked like which was created using these cameras. This is what the studios used to look like in 19th century. And these were called daylight studios. So 19th century photographic studios relied on daylight for illumination. 
to capture as much light as possible uh, and to keep exposure times to minimum, they had glass roofs and walls. Movable uh, blinds and curtains allowed the photographer to control the amount of light and direction of light. This is a typical uh, retouching table from those days. You mm. can see a glass plate. A very interesting camera, Vageshwari, a classic camera, which was actually produced in India. And uh, you won't believe Okay, this was actually uh, manufactured in uh, uh, Belgaum and uh, Belga. by Govind Velling, G.G. Velling. So photography was announced to the world on 19th August, 1839. And uh, by the way, that is uh, what a month and one day away. And that it was celebrated. Uh, it is today celebrated as birthday of photography. Why? Because 19th August, 1839 is when uh, De Gure announced his process to the French government. And the French government actually uh, paid him off and took away the patent from him and announced it's a gift to the mankind. And uh, that is why it's celebrated as birthday of photography. Uh, first permanent process uh, by Degu. Little later, Eastman, whose company is known as Kodak, now, there is a big story. Why is it known as Kodak? East, George Eastman, who was a bank clerk in Rochester, uh, went to England and Europe, picked up all the technology, came to America and set up his company in Rochester and started making cameras. So we have some of his cameras from 1897, 1899, uh, that is a stereo camera, panorama camera from 1899. And uh, so how this company evolved and how his logos evolved is very interesting. So the word Kodak, what does it mean? He, he went to the British patent office and uh, they said, what is this Kodak? So, you know, this was his answer. It's not a foreign name or a word. It was constructed by me to serve a definite purpose. It has the following merits as a trademark word. It is short. Second, it is not capable of mispronunciation. Third, it does not resemble anything in the art and cannot be associated with anything in the art except Kodak. And that is how the word Kodak happened. A lot of people don't understand. They think Eastman was Kodak. No, Kodak was his patent and his name was Eastman. Uh, he created fantastic cameras uh, uh, which were mobile, which were easy to use and they had a unique feature. He called them autographic. What autographic meant was you could actually, with the stylus, write or scratch on the film and write the date or the name of the place or the person, whatever you were shooting. Uh, so can you imagine, like we say today, uh, can you annotate or put meta words and things? So. 1890s, they actually figured out a way to scratch the film 
and they call the cameras photographic cameras. So one of the most iconic cameras ever manufactured which revolutionized photography was Brownie. One dollar camera which actually changed the way yeah. photography was sold to the world because with one dollar camera which used to come with the film, he said, I want to make sure that every household has this camera. And uh, so it used to come with a film and you could shoot give it back to the Kodak lab uh, and get a new film. And they in turn used to give you the prints also. So he created a captive market for himself, uh, which no. was brilliant. Uh, so, you know, you can understand what was happening. The French invented photography, English refined it by creating the, the idea of negative and uh, further added many processes while the Americans actually marketed the technology and made more <laughs> money than the French or the English. So, sir, so I have yes. a question here. Uh, yes. If I, if I remember, I don't know, I have not um, done photography in that era. But uh, if I know right about this camera, was it uh, one time use? So, it was, they used to break it open? No, and, no, okay, no. Okay. I'll, I'll just show you this. Yeah. used to come with a, a film and so you had to give the camera back to them and uh, they used to put a new roll of film in this and give it back to you and give it back to you so okay. you see how cleverly um, used Kodak 620M films uh, yeah yeah so he created a captive market which is the beauty of this and uh, what led to, you know, the idea of family album was born because he was able to influence so many people to actually create images that albums were being made. For once, people were creating, while daguerreotype was so expensive, it was so difficult, you had to go to a... Uh, uh, somebody who knew the technology, uh, family albums were, uh, you just had to get images done. And then he started advertising. So look at his ads. For old and young, there is a fascination in photography, a fascination that becomes a lasting satisfaction for those who spell camera, Kodak. So, <laughs> you know, Right from day one, he was looking at marketing, marketing, and uh, he used women, family. So the whole idea was so, in every outing, Kodak. Very clever marketing, very clever. So we've lost your voice. So I'm very much here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 while the camera is going around to uh, show you things and... Uh... Well, he didn't just market his brand and his cameras. He, in, in effect, actually marketed photography. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like he created an entire, you know, art form. You know, what is very interesting, uh, Jesse, about this photography is, and the whole idea of the museum is that uh, I'm trying to connect the technology with the art because a lot of people don't understand the kind of technology which has gone into these images, creating these images. Yeah. A uh, lot of people are interpreting images without understanding the technology behind these images. So like these Graflex cameras, can you imagine these bulky Graflex cameras were, these were the workhorses of all the photojournalists and 
studio photographers in from 1901 onwards till 1950s. Must have been a pain to carry them, really, as, as a photojournalist. Uh, absolutely. But uh, so you just see I amateurs and professionals. Uh, is it, uh, Margaret Burke. Uh, uh, Margaret Burke White, she used Graflex cameras to create and some of those iconic pictures. Standing on top of a car or a vehicle with this camera. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So these were very bulky. Uh, then subsequently they came out in another version, speed graphic. That means you could shoot much faster. It had many kind of uh, viewfinders. It had, uh, uh, you could actually look through this. It had, uh, it had a viewfinder here. Uh, you could also open the back and uh, do studio work. Um, so you can imagine the versatility. It could take film rolls. It could take sheet films. Um, uh, these are fantastic uh, and they also offered little bit of movement and parallax control. Wow. So amazing cameras, speed graphic. So does this company still exist or they've gone the Kodak way? Oh, they've gone the Kodak way long time back. Long time ago. Yeah. Long time back. And, I guess uh, that's the thing about technology. You get so comfortable with it as a manufacturer that you don't realize that the world is moving on. Yeah. So one of the most important companies in the world was Zeiss, which uh, made Zeiss icons. That's my Zeiss icon, which is here from uh, 1970. And uh, that's one of their iconic cameras, Quantaflex. Um, so... Uh, in 1880s, actually, Eastman revolutionized photography by introducing the roll film. Before that, uh, there were sheet films, and there were these giant cameras which were used to capture images. Now you see this uh, century camera. This was a uh, Typical studio camera. This is the size of the sheet film. So this camera was invented in 1899. So that's why it's called century, turn of the century. And one of the most popular studio cameras used all over the world. To, and these are the sheet film holders, by the way. And you can see the glass plates in them. Okay. Dinesh, it must be quite really Sorry, uh, someone go on. No, no, I'm just saying, Dinesh, uh, we just saw those uh, sheet film holders of 8 by 10. There was yeah. You key to <laughs> what you're talking earlier. <laughs> no, the other point, you know, which has always fascinated me is that, you know, each camera used to be like a work of art. It's just like in itself, it's like sculpture, you know, yeah. done with wood mm -hmm. and, you know, metal and glass. And, you know, ever since uh, cameras became standardized with digital, I mean, they had don't have character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, no, I think, you know, because you look, the, you look at the large formats, it's virtually, a, it's almost like made to order or custom made for, you know, it's, it's so it's just the beauty of that is something else. Yeah, no, and I think also because we didn't have this assembly line manufacturing, you know. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, such a, it's totally, I mean, this is engineering, it's about art, it's about science, it's about so many mm -hmm. things which went in into it. Yeah? So, so like we talk about flashlights today. So can you imagine, uh, this is the world's first flashlight. It was nothing but a holder for 
uh, magnesium powder, uh, which could be ignited. Uh, this is how pictures were done. And then subsequently came this, the bulbs. And uh, so these bulbs were one off. And after each shot, they had to be replaced. And occasionally they used to burst. Um, very tricky to use, but uh, this is how photography was done. Uh, this is typically from early century. So this traces the history of flash and uh, You know, I just want to point out something for people who haven't been to the museum. Uh, you know, the way uh, this entire curatorial, I mean, the way it has been put together, not just the way, uh, you know, the, the timelines, but in terms of uh, it is so brilliant for a person who has no idea about photography. You get in there and you won't stop going, you know, from panel to one window to the next box. It is so amazingly arranged. Uh, it's so, so user friendly. And, and the best part is that uh, it's like you come out and all of a sudden you figure out over 150 years of what photography is all about, you know. So here I must mention this entire museum, something which I dreamt of, which I thought about over the years. And uh, these are things which I collected over the last 40 years. Uh, slowly, whenever I was traveling, I was in Europe or anywhere I used to go look for specific things and I was constantly reading about uh, things which were invented and how they were used to create images. And um, so when I, once we started working on the museum, uh, we didn't have a, a museologist. Uh, I have a problem with that word museologist and I have a problem with those people who call themselves museologists because I spoke to few people they had no idea of, uh, see, they have to know the subject. They have to know photography before. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they only dwell in, uh, oh, this is what is going to be very interpretive, very, I mean, big words are used. And here, so I worked with some friends. I worked with uh, uh, one of the leading graphic designer, uh, Gopika Chofla. Uh, she and her team helped me with the actual uh, graphics of the museum, which is very important. I had the color, I had the, uh, I had an idea of what I wanted, and, but you need a graphic designer. Uh, but so, and with this whole museum was created without the help of a, a museologist uh, or uh, uh, people who specialize in museums. Or, uh, so they were friends, they were architects, they were, they were people who walked in and created this, uh, helped me create this museum. Here is something very interesting. Today we don't even bother because all the cameras have light meters. You know, this actually, this amazing collection from 1890s, has all kind of light meters. Uh, the way light was calculated by photographers, they were cheat sheets, they were, they were all kind of optical devices, they were glasses, they could look through. Uh, like, uh, I'm gonna show you something. This is from, uh, this was made by Zeiss Icon. Can you imagine? Zeiss Icon was making light meters so there are some amazing light meters from uh, last uh, 150 years here, which help photographers calculate the amount of light required for the perfect exposure. Uh, but what is very interesting is uh, how was, what did shutter look like? So I'm gonna ask everybody a question. I showed you some glass plates. What do you think was the ISO or ASA as we used to call it during the analog times, the sensitivity of those glass plates? Jesse? Hello? 
Yeah, I would. Yeah, we can hear you. I would not know. Mm. Make a guess. Make a wild guess. Let's let's. Okay. Um, Summer. Eight hundred. Okay. So typically, a glass plate from eighteen eighties, eighteen sixties had an ISO of three. Three. Yes. Oh so my. the exposure time was very long. So there were no shutters. This is a shutter from 1860. So you see how the shutter works? It's just a disc <laughs> because it used to take minutes. It used to take, you know, half a minute, one minute for a perfect exposure. So you didn't need a shutter. So just a disc, which could be. open or a cap and these are some of the shutters and this is make a guess what is this this is an aperture this is an aperture I, I, from i wanted to ask one thing yeah so since you sh were showing the uh, shutter uh we 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 call something called f stops and all so that stop word did it come from this that you have to stop the light and something like that reduce the light reduce the light so, yeah uh, people think f stop is a platform on which people talk uh, no <laughs> 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 but f stops these are the original apertures apertures they were called water house tops why uh, they were invented by john water house in 1850 so these were plates which were inserted inside the lens for reducing the amount of light, light. so you see how they were used uh, amazing So, so this is where the leaf cutter uh, became the. So each of these apertures is a f sixteen to twenty two to eleven. Absolutely. To... So you see these large ones; they are meant for those large lenses. Hmm. So it virtually goes from a twenty two to a f two point eight or whatever you know. Depending on the lens size. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So then comes one of the most iconic camera ever manufactured in India. Can you believe? It's Click Three. All of us grew up with it in 1970s. Uh, it used to cost 300 rupees. See, Click Three. It was considered very premium, and uh, only uh, well-to-do families could afford to buy that camera. <laughs> it was nothing but it's a, you know what i look at these lomo cameras so it was a plastic camera with three shutter speeds for shade for sun for uh, cloud uh, and that's it nothing more you put a film three things and click if it comes it's great twin lens reflex another very uh, iconic cameras as i mentioned uh, you had to look through this like this there was also an attachment but most of the photographers actually shot at waist level with this yeah and typically the problem was there was a parallax issue uh, because this is the seeing lens this is the taking lens and uh, you know there were issues you did the not get exactly the what the you the were yeah. uh, seeing and uh, so but in india this was like every photographer had a uh, parallax Uh, this uh, yeah. uh, TLRs. My father, my father had Yashika. Yes, this is Yashika D. Yeah. So Mamia Yashika, these are very popular, and So I'm 
going to be talking about one of the most iconic camera ever manufactured in India, uh, which is the beauty. With this is actually uh, there was a uh, Sadarji in uh, Bhogal, uh, Mr. Sardul Singh, and uh, he made this camera called Raja. Can you imagine this camera is handcrafted? It is. Uh, he was a lathe operator. And uh, who created uh, uh, this camera? And uh, he used to sell this in New York for hundred dollars, I believe. And uh, that's where his market was. This was a copy of a very famous Western camera called Beardoff, a very famous camera. And this is an exact replica of Beardoff. And uh, uh, this I was able to buy from him in some time in early nineties. Uh, went to Bogal and uh, picked up this camera, uh, but uh, uh, he had another piece. But uh, by the time I went back to that piece uh, to him, uh, because I didn't have money, and uh, uh, he had passed away, and his family had sold that house, and the house wasn't there anymore. So I wish I had picked up both the cameras uh, then and there. But uh, look at this, beautifully crafted, and uh, what a beauty! Yeah. And it's four by five inches. Amazing. So, Weidlander, another famous camera, Horseman. Argus. That was my brand, Horseman. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I think Dinesh maybe. Uh, yes, donated by Dinesh Khanna. Here. <laughs> so, so um, out of. That's what I course, used to use. Two and two thousand, three thousand cameras which I have, uh, uh, one or two percent are donated, and uh, we always acknowledge whoever has donated cameras here by mentioning it in the register, and whenever it's displayed, it's uh, uh, duly acknowledged. Uh, very famous camera, Zenith and Fink, and uh, a lot of people have this camera because. Lot of, all of us learned 35mm on these cameras. Uh, these were available for uh, 1500. Oh, we, we lost him. Uh, leather jackets in 70s. Okay, okay, yeah. Palika Bazaar used to be a great place to buy. Yeah, those. another place was Palika Bazaar. <laughs> yeah. Or the Russian tourists, East European tourists used to come and sell the cameras here. <laughs> so, this is, you entered the dark room. So, since the inception of photography in the early 19th century, uh, you know, dark rooms have evolved from wagons, tents to elaborate labs. In the early days, many photographers used portable dark rooms or dark tents. And uh, this is how, but uh, by 1910, uh, Kodak and many companies were making dark rooms. And uh, a lot of this is historic stuff and a uh, place to develop, stop bar, fixer. This is what the enlargers used to look like. This is where the contact prints, uh, this is how the contract prints used to look like. Uh, so this is, you know, what you have today, Lightroom. This is the analog version of Lightroom. Lightroom. <laughs> I mean, photography has come a long way. It's, uh, use light block, Lightroom use block block light for dodging and burning the block or release more light. Yes, we have those little, little devices here yeah. for dodging and burning. burning yeah. So we're going back to the cameras and uh, so one of the most iconic camera Aditya, which is I don't know if you can, Aditya, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. You know, you have to have to show my favorite camera there, which is the one which you got on from the bombers, you know, from World War II. Yes, we're coming there. Okay, right. that's important. So, <laughs> this is... Uh, when fully assembled, this camera can weigh between 100 kgs. 
this is called process camera and uh, so this camera was used to create the printing plates for the for newspapers for magazines uh, so this is called process camera and uh, so it, we have removed all the paraphernalia to reduce the weight but it actually when we picked it up uh, this was around 4 500 kgs outstanding so here is k20 so this camera was used to shoot these two iconic pictures of atom bomb the mushroom cloud when it was uh, uh, this is nagasaki uh, august 9 1945 this is august 6 1945 and uh, this camera was actually manufactured by a subsidiary of Kodak for aerial shooting. It, had, it used to use large format for the film and uh, it had a few hundred feet to film in this because they didn't have time to change the film uh, while they were dropping this, uh, while they were shooting the uh, aerial warfare or re reconnaissance. Hmm. Some uh, iconic spy cameras. These are miniature iconic spy cameras. I have one in my hand, which is uh, Minox. And uh, this was also used in, uh, by CIA, CIA in 1972 to document the Watergate scandal and Nixon had to resign because of the documentation because uh, he was actually, uh, the whole thing was captured on this and he had to resign and uh, he lost his citizenship. Another uh, interesting camera is Pika. This is from 1907. This is a spy camera, which is like a watch. It's called Tika. And uh, you know, that's the lens cover. This is the winding mechanism, and that's the shutter. Whoa. <laughs> and so the story of photography carries on, and uh, the idea of 3D actually started in 1880s when they announced the world uh, announced to the world the stereoscopy and so the fundamentals of stereoscopy is same as uh, uh, your binocular vision uh, you are seeing two different things which are being juxtaposed inside so they used to capture two images which when looked through a viewfinder appeared 3D. Oh. So can you imagine these are 3D cameras from 1880s and early century. So many of you may not know before uh, people associate Canon with uh, uh, SLRs and things and all, but uh, they actually used to make 35 rangefinder cameras. That's Canon 3, 1951-52. And um, it looks very similar to Leica. I think that's the time when the Japanese were just getting the industries going and were doing a lot of copying of uh, other people's designs and technologies. 
What's the way This wrong? camera is a copy of Leica 3, uh, Leica Model 2. And uh, I'm going to show you the Leica also. And uh, you will see that this is an exact replica of that. But also very interesting is nine, the logo. In 1933, the company used the name Kwanon meaning the Buddhist goddess of mercy for his camera. The lotus, the logo represented the image of goddess Kwanon with flames and thousand arms. So if you see the original logo. So my favorite camera, finally, Sinar. Uh, the ultimate camera ever manufactured. What do you say, Samar? Yes, you can make out who the rich photographers were. Samar and Addy had this. I could not even afford one. <laughs> I went to the horseman because it cost less than half of what a Sinar did. You know, when I bought this Sinar in 92, it was close to 8 lakhs. Uh, just the basic camera. And... Uh, and look at some of the images created. These are original slides. Oh. And this is... Uh, Finally, the camera which also changed photography. Uh, Polaroid. Uh, so Edwin Lang, actually who invented this, he was on a holiday with his family when his three-year-old daughter asked him why she couldn't see the pictures that were just taken. And that was the idea behind Polaroid. And he actually invented Polaroid. So we are back to the, the most important camera, which was also used by uh, people like uh, uh, who uh, by Robert Capa, and uh, when he was shooting the Spanish Civil War, uh, Leica M3, uh, one of the toughest cameras ever manufactured, and. Uh, the idea of uh, decisive movement actually happened because of this camera. It was quick to operate, it was fast, it was discreet, and uh, you could shoot uh, 35, uh, very fast with this because of the half crank and uh, quick movements. Aditya, can you just talk about one small thing, you know, in the background, uh, not many people know, but uh, that Hindu film, you know, you got that uh, thing hanging there. If you can just quickly say something on that, please. So it's very interesting. Hindu film. Uh, yeah. I got it. Yeah. Some of the famous film brands. Did Hindu make film or did, did they repackage it? I think they... So, Hindu used to also uh, Hindustan photo film. Uh, they used to cut bulk film and uh, repackage it. And respool and, and uh, Hindu film was called because uh, of... It was actually inaugurated by Indira Gandhi, the plant or something like that. It has something to do with that. That's why it's called Hindu. So Nikon, uh, my workhorse for a long time. And uh, I actually used uh, FM10 and... Uh, 
F3s, F4s. So, you know, a lot of us just love the sound of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it yeah. was so soothing to hear this. Absolutely. And no amount of digital can replicate the sound of an F10 or FM. Pentex. So this is Spotmatic and this is the Spotmatic I used to actually shoot my Janibu De Aro stills with. And this was, the, uh, this was also the camera Ravi Baswani used in the film. So friends, that's the journey of the, that's the camera museum. There is a lot more to see. We have a very interesting uh, uh, studio here. Uh, this is uh, called Jhatpat Studio. And uh, this is our museum shop where we sell prints and film, which is very important. Um, Film is coming back and, you know, analog, there is so much of discipline in film. And uh, we are actually processing film here in the dark room and we are making amateurs and professionals who would like to experiment with film. You've lost your voice, sir. I'm coming back. I'm okay. coming back. I'm uh, trying to showcase some of the artworks and uh... so. How was this museum made possible? This museum was made possible because of friends. Who photographers, people who contributed. So we have a wall right at the entrance, which actually acknowledges each and every person who contributed towards this museum. Uh, I mean, some were, uh, many names are not there because they didn't want their names, uh, but we have tried to acknowledge everyone here at the museum. So we're back inside the gallery now, and I'm ready to face any questions. And, uh... Uh, Aditya, can you just point out, uh, you know, the very first commercially available uh, digital camera, you know, that big Kodak uh, horse, I think you have one there somewhere. Uh, no, the first, I mean, one of the first ones, you remember that which got introduced in early 2000, which was stupid money. And today it's like, uh, you can't imagine carrying, uh, you know, such a massive thing. Mm. It's a Kodak. Kodak. Yeah, Kodak, it was, I think you have it sitting. Yeah, there it is, is it? Uh, sorry. So I, this I is uh -huh. 14, 14 <laughs> megapixel camera in 2010, which Kodak sold us for 2.5 lakhs without the lens and it barely worked for six months. They were able to sell uh, probably three of these cameras. Hardesh bought one, I bought, I bought two. And before they said, oh, sorry, we are withdrawing it. Uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> that was the end of the story. I, I mean, I have... it was a sheer, but can you imagine 2005, I was using 14 megapixel uh, these are the uh, CDs of that, the <laughs> software.
but what is very interesting is this is how actually digital came to the world sony movica and kodak disc 4000 if some of you remember these were the early cameras uh, which were launched so 1982 sony demonstrated uh, uh, movica Nineteen eighty, uh, Kodak announced compact disc cameras. So this uh, timeline is very interesting. Uh, besides the photographers, it traces technology. It also mentions the foreign photographers, Indian photographers like Kishore Parekh, Mary Ellen Mark, uh, Sunil Jana, and. Uh, various art forms and uh, so Oh, wonderful! Are you switching cameras right now, or what's happening? Yes, I'm on. Uh... Yes, I'm on my yeah laptop yeah. now. So thank it you. It was it was such a such a wonderful. Uh, I don't know what to say. Um, one second, one second. I can't. Uh, the process of switching. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, your voice is really down. Uh, one second. One second. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, yeah, better. Please. Go on now. Okay, I'm on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we can hear. Yeah. Wait. Technology issues in this analog museum. <laughs> uh, I think I think we still we we did it very seamlessly. Okay, thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, very seamlessly. So, sir, um, uh, I don't know what to say. This has been one uh, journey that that I think everybody. Um, I don't know. It's been it's been awe inspiring, looking at so much and and you put so much of effort. Over the years, so there. Uh, even I had to answer ask this, but then there's a question from Chetan Dodwad on on YouTube. Uh, when and how did the idea of this museum take shape? And the second extended part is that how long did it take um, for it to come into actual being? So very interesting question. Um, uh, you know, I was I'm. I studied history, and I, I looked at it like this: that this is the history of my uh, profession, and uh, and history has always uh, interested me. And something which I really like to do is I like to document. I like to actually look into things and say that you everybody should be doing things and leaving them for posterity. Uh, you have to create histories. you have to uh, so this was my attempt now how did this happen uh, i don't know i think there is a force which uh, actually facilitates all this uh, you but you have to think and you have to really work hard on it and say i'm not going to give up and i'm going to do it and uh, uh, i believe me uh, this museum I started construction in two thousand and 
18 and 2019 uh, on the 28th August, that's last year, we inaugurated the museum. It took me one year and few months to make this entire building. Uh, I thought about it in 2017 uh, when some um, uh, IES officers read about my museum and came to my residence, they saw my basement and they said, what are you going to do with this? I said, I would like to make a museum one day, but uh, it's not possible. They said, suppose if we work, work out something. I said, absolutely, I'm going to do it. We didn't have an architect. We didn't have designers. As I said, we didn't have so-called museologists. I just said, nothing is going to stop uh, me. I bought uh, almost um, 50, 60 books on museums. I read all of them and I, I said, I'm going to make a museum and I know how to make a museum. This is it. Um, you know, everybody can do anything. I'm a self-taught museologist. Self, uh, and I sat here and constructed this. Uh, Dinesh can tell you, I've been sitting here for the last uh, one and a half year when the building was being made and supervised the, because we didn't have dedicated engineers here. So I was sorting out all the issues of structure on telephone with people sending them pictures and saying, I want to shift this pillar. Can I, do you think this is a load bearing pillar? Can I shift it? Can I move this around wall? Uh, this is how this museum happened. Wow. Uh, so that's the hardware of the museum. What about the software? And I'm including the cameras. So can you just tell us about, you know, how your entire, I can understand that you wanted to collect, but you know, the entire process of collecting, where did you find the cameras? How did you manage to put it together? Uh, you so know, it must have been also associated research which you were doing, because after some point, it would not have been just about picking up an old camera, but also in terms of timeline, in terms of, you know, logic. That process is an ongoing process. I'm still doing that. And um, the catching up with the, the whole timeline of photography, who did what and where I could find things like that is something which I keep uh, calling up people and researching. So I call myself a global Kabadi. Uh, most of the Kabadis and dealers all over the world know me and I keep getting uh, uh, WhatsApp messages day and night. Sir, ek, oh, we have this. Uh, somebody from France or Germany or uh, some uh, uh, village in Maharashtra. Ki I have this. Do you think this could uh, work for you? Um, it's an ongoing process. But while all this planning was happening, I actually uh, was also doing cataloging. I, we, uh, you know that I've always had one or two interns. I used to give them uh, uh, books and I used to tell them, uh, these are the five things, uh, find the references from here. So we kept collating all the information. So with like three years, we had all the information on each brand and companies and uh, uh, manufacturers or processes of photography, uh, which is always being updated because I know there is so much research happening uh, all over the world in the old photographic practices. And so are you still uh, you know, looking at collecting more cameras and lenses and things, or do you feel that your stories so my story uh, would be an obsession to get them? The other is that if you're fitting them into, you know, this particular Lego piece now, uh, the timeline of the museum. So I or still have you to... You're looking beyond that to something else now. I have still have few thousand cameras in the basement of my house, which you know, <laughs> which have not been displayed, but that is not the issue. Uh, so the point is, I'm not... Uh, I like to collect. I am but I'm not a collector. This is more than a collection. It requires interpretation and- Logic here, there's this- Yeah. yeah. So there are, um, 
uh, there are few people in India who will say, I have 5,000 cameras, I am number one. I don't want to be that. To me, uh, each piece has a story. I am trying to bring out that story of that uh, camera or the lens or the aperture or the shutter because for them, it is the number. For me, it doesn't matter. It's not the number game. It's a, what does it signify? What it so those shutters which I showed you, they actually are from the time when photography was very slow. The idea of taking portraiture was planning, shooting, coating the glass plate and exposing and then processing the glass. So that process had to be done within 15 minutes of shooting. It could not be you, the dry plates, which could be processed happened in 1880s. While the early days, the wet place had to be coated and processed immediately. So, so much has gone into technology. So when you look at the images, you should say, oh, this image actually has so many layers buried under it. So what people are seeing is the top layer. What I want people to also see in historic images is the layers which are invisible, which are buried in the technology of how that image was created. Actually, that's what I was, you know, while you were talking and one of the, I was going to say that, you know, you are a historian, not a collector. I would go a step further and say you're an actual archaeologist who happens to, no. I'm a visual <laughs> archaeologist. I'm you're a, a, yeah, archaeologist. You're a, an archaeologist of photography. So, you know, you're looking at both the logic and the timelines and the layers and what, you know, came before and finding reason for it, because a lot of it, for instance, information could start getting lost otherwise, you know. Yeah, uh, even sometimes when I see a camera, then I see what kind of images was it used to create? And then I say, oh my God, this was created. This is how they were creating this image. And um, so all the historical work has to be seen and analyzed in terms, it has to be contextualized with the equipment which was being used. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not talking about the contemporary work. I'm talking about the historical work. The history of photography has to be contextualized with the technology of that time. Right, right. And so then coming to the present, I mean, do you see the museum being a repository of photography and photographic equipment going forward and you keep adding to that? So, uh, two things. I would like it to be repository, what you were saying, of photographic works in this country. When, when, so, what did I create with Kulwant Roy's collection? These 20, 30,000 images of his time, his archive. Is, they are very valuable. They have been digitized. Uh, we I spent almost, uh, between me and the people who supported me, we spent almost close to 80, 90 lakhs in digitizing those images in the best possible formats. And they have been preserved in multiple hard drives in uh, RAID machines. Why? I would like, I know the physical images may not survive, but the future generations should be able to see these images. But when photographers die, my own archive of thousands and thousands of images is uh, lying buried. I have not even looked at uh, many of them, like uh, my work of Alchi Monastery in Ladakh, where I worked and document every inch of that monastery Nobody in the world has that kind of documentation. I did that in mid 2000. Uh, it wasn't about money. It's about, uh, I wanted to work there and document that uh, monastery. So all that has to be like your work. So like my work. So the foundation has to be a repository for future generations where these images should be available and should be preserved, should and these stories should be documented for future generations. But for that is first, but uh, on the 16th of March, when we 
because of pandemic when we shut down this museum we had enough money to pay people for till may and we had to request everybody to leave today we just we are running this entire place with two three people and uh, and though they are also on 50% and we borrowed money and some people have donated money i don't know where the future of this museum lies it's kind of scary uh, uh, a museum like this requires between even in shutdown condition i require between 4 to 5 lakhs a month in running condition i require between 10 to 15 lakhs where is the money to even start this museum again is my concern is where are we going to get the money to kick start this uh, it's kind of very scary i mean if we have to i had announced ki 15th of july will open but there is no money right now uh, because once things start working when Uh, there are guards there is housekeeping your expenses go up and this is a crowd funded museum this is uh, we were hoping to uh, it was doing pretty well on the 16th of march when we shut down we had 6 630 bookings that week from schools and children and groups who wanted to visit that particular uh, from monday to saturday and now uh, with this lockdown i don't know what's going to happen and also the residual effect of people being worried about being in a public space and you know all that but that's yeah another story altogether yeah oh, that is uh, i guess unfortunately will unfold in all its ramifications over the next few months now uh, yeah but just for a moment to come sorry summer No, no. Go ahead, Dinesh, please. No, 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 no. Carry on, carry on. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, you know, of course, I mean, nobody knows whatever the immediate uh, or long-term impact of, uh, you know, what has happened with this virus. But uh, going back to, you know, this unbelievable institution, what you have uh, created, uh, you know, and so much of partnerships. There's so many, many people who are so much part of. this entire space what you have done and i don't mean just the physical space uh, you know what I, i really like to hear from you about uh, you know you and the nation some of you guys have been working towards the education part of uh, photography and i don't mean just the labs and the you know the archival processes or the older processes but what are we doing i mean what are you doing in terms of the education into the photography part so uh, my funda was to create a place which was um, i mean to leave behind a place dedicated to photography and um, in all its avatars you know whether it's teaching repositories and uh, and i was able to drive and convince the government ki let's create a place like that and somehow it did happen but uh i don't know if dinesh has an idea on uh, we hope to do things we have many plans but uh, when things will get uh, normal the new normal uh, mm -hmm. is a big question uh, uh this is a physical space i'm still hoping to open this place on the 1st of august i have announced ki 1st of august i'm going to open this place and i have to arrange for some funds to make sure that this place we are able to pay for the housekeeping and the security and the uh, interns because again those 15 20 people will be required here to run this place it's mammoth is 18000 square feet and is almost 0.75 acre of land and uh, we'll require funds uh, which we are hoping somehow uh, so i'm going to reach out to the photography community say Uh, very soon by next week say hey can we run a campaign by which we can sell your prints can we do something uh, can we uh, would you like to donate prints can we start uh, reaching out to people so buy prints for whatever 25000 10000 15000 and collect money so that we can kick start this place right mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and of course, one would be looking at, you know, uh, probably if not long term educational programs, but workshops and, you know, small uh, review sessions. Uh, the idea really would be to get people back here, one for the museum, two for education, three for shows, uh, you know, four for talks. And that is actually what your entire uh, infrastructure is about. Uh, so that I think, well, one will have to be a bit patient, but I'm sure over the next few months will start happening. Well, 1st August, I hope to open it. Let's see. Mm. I think wishing wishing for this to happen because I think all fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, things have not been uh, good so far, but yeah, um, we still have to be optimistic. And I think what you've done is phenomenal. And I'm sure that if you could reach this level and still do it despite all odds, um, rest will also happen. And I think I. I I'm a firm believer that doors open up when you reach there. So probably we are not seeing those doors now. Yeah. I, very soon you will be able to see those doors and our good wishes are going to be there. And if in any which way if we can contribute in a way to, to reach out to a photography community from Exploring Light and, and um, even through these extra bite sessions, we would be more than happy and keen and delighted to be a part. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you very much. And uh, as I say, as Nike says, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> I firmly believe. And there's also another version. We say jarts do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say, hey, man, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Think twice about it. And that's how this museum was created. It was a battle. I mean, without any... A uh, full-time engineer sitting here. There is so much. Uh, so I said, never mind. I used to sit here with all the drawings and I used to correct the drawings, call up all the suppliers and say, uh, this has to be then, this wire is wrong, this uh, steel, this cement. And I used to check everything. And that's how this thing was made. And uh, so if that could be done, I'm sure, uh, starting on the 1st of August, uh, could be achieved. You know, I, must, I, must, I must add one thing, you know, it's uh, the nation we, uh, you know, we talk about that if there was a museum and if it was a photo museum and if it had to be made, the only person who can actually pull this off is Aditya because the way you have gone, done this thing, I mean, I've, we've all seen you, you know, going through, you know, trying to put those pillars there and, you know, of course, today it's all finished product. But man, uh, hats off to you the way you have basically just and that to dealing with department of, you know, Bijli and municipality and Haryana Sarkar and all that. Oh, my God, you try to build a little house. You, you don't. I mean, this is a museum, you know, <laughs> you're talking about that too in such an amazing space, prime space, so well connected next to the metro. You know, there's so many things uh, really hats off to you on that. So there is always somebody who makes you do things. OK. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. And then you've seen that wall, people who help me, that yes. acknowledgement wall is very important. The people who help me actually make the museum. Absolutely. They contributed. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to add something else here, which is, you know, when we talk about the archives, uh, you know, that Kulwant Roy's work, you know, I feel that it couldn't have gone to any better person than, than you. And I really mean that, you know, I'm not just saying because, you know, all great friendship and the stuff I've seen what you've done, but, you know, I, you know, this, those suitcases could have landed somewhere else and would have become, you know, a bunch of prints or whatever it is, you know, you made sure. And I remember those years, you know, before, of course, we saw it much later when the books came out and the NGMA show, show opened up and all that stuff. But my God, the amount of you know sweat you had, and it has to be only you. And that that runs through exactly what you said when you went to that INA market and you're looking for that one tomato and open up a whole bag of tomatoes. That's the reason why you could do the museum. That's the reason why you could do the archives. That's why what you are, Aditya. And that's the reason this doesn't stop. You know, it'll continue the way you wanna go. You know. Yeah. The persistence space. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great, yeah. And you know, um, I, I'm just. Um, um, we are already reaching three hours, and I think it's phenomenal three hours. 
but i just jotted down while while you were sharing about your journey as well and there's a lot of learning uh, for young photographers including me and everybody out there is that how easily and how effortlessly you just uh, uh, mentioned something about that you are a self taught photographer i mean i mean in an era when when there were hardly any resources to learn uh, they were uh, even today we find it difficult uh, to really to really learn something logically and methodically through google and all when there the resources are there and you could so easily said that uh, say that you are a self learned uh, photographer and and then you are showing the images and the backstage mm-hmm. kind of that setup of aeroplane that's phenomenal that's humongous like uh, and and i think we people um, i was feeling ashamed of of myself that uh, over a period of years that we have we have boasted uh, in 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 a, in a way that we are self learned no we are not we are, we are uh, uh, we've hardly done justice to even uh, the alphabet p of photography and and because those era, th- that era is something totally different learning and that to self learning um i i don't know i can't even visualize that i can't understand that is, um, there was no place i, I remember in 70s i joined college in 77 and there was no place to go and learn photography so i used to go to the library flip through the national geography flip through various magazines and try and figure out as dinesh said hey, trying to figure out how was this image taken deconstruct yeah it was a process which i and i still look at images and say uh, how was this done uh, but today i know are yaar wo photoshop kar liya yaar wo cut paste kar liya why do you think in 2006 7 8 9 10 i totally drifted into my museum and archiving why people were coming to me and saying sir ye khichna hai but uh, sir itna khich do baki hum dekh lenge dekh lenge <laughs> uh, which was i said excuse me i've never done it i i i'll give you one no 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 sir itna time nahi hai please uh, aap mujhe na ek basic sa itna ye khich ke de do main isko kaat karke udhar laga dunga don't waste time so you know i lost uh, half my passion of uh, working with uh, such art directors and clients was over i said yeah this is this is not photography was a challenge photography was a problem solving it was about light lenses yeah and if you could still maintain your passion that is when you are really a passionate photographer because then uh, i think we lose our passion by aaj to ek wo light humse fix nahi hui it is such a pain and and and, and you maintain passion for so long and and you brought it to a level where you have created something like museo camera and and like summer sir just mentioned that kulwant roy's this thing archiving thing um it could i think it, it it is we we all are fortunate that it landed with you and you could do it otherwise <laughs> otherwise as he rightly said it could have forgotten in in some oblivion and and probably gotten destroyed on its own so um, it looks like uh, i'm fated to do many things which come my way and i say somebody says you got to do this you got to create a museum you got to locate these cameras you got to locate you got to clean this archive you got to do this so wo hota hai na purane zamane zamane mein kehte the wo pashchataap kar rahe hain to atonement of your past deeds you have to do so many things for the sake of photography uh, before you can say i am quit Yeah, so I would put it, uh, you know, in contemporary times, uh, Aditya, I would put you as more as a purist, you know, because you're so much a believer of, uh, you know, the principle of things and not just caught up in, you know, this two-second world of photography. You know, the 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 I would say the digital noise we live under. 
you know, you wherever you have set yourself, whether it's your Katy body or whether it's your museum or whether it's your archives, man, you just go for it and you just don't leave it. You just gonna get to the bottom of it. And I think really you know, salute to that. Thank you. I was selling vegetables for three years. Ask Dinesh, uh, my, uh, on Saturday, Sunday, my drive used to be the local vegetable market where I used to go to the farm uh, on Friday evening, bring all the vegetables and people used to come and pick up vegetables. It went on for three years and then this construction started and I said, sorry, I have no time for the farm now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, and I get lots of calls. So if you, on the, on the net, I am referred to as uh, organic farmer. So I still, sir, wo aapke paas kaunsi kaunsi sabjiyan hai aaj kal. So I said, I'm not growing anything. So every day I get calls. Sir, kya bech rahe hai aaj kal is season mein? Uh, I don't know. I think it's been phenomenal. Uh, I don't know. People are just, there are no questions, uh, but they're all praises and how they're feeling uh, today. Thank you. And, and it's been all phenomenal. And I remember that day when uh, I was speaking to Dinesh sir and Dinesh sir said, I'll have to convince uh, Aditya Arya to really, um, uh, he doesn't come. So I was keeping all the fingers crossed that he should agree. And then finally he said, okay, now, now we, he can come. And I am so thankful to everybody and um, um, Dinesh sir for, for somehow convincing you to uh, come here. Some of us are in the last minute to agree to be here on, as a panel. And obviously you uh, for taking so much time out and even in pandemic and everything is locked down and you still come to your uh, music camera and open it and show it to all of us, everybody there and, and take us through this live journey, um, history lane uh, uh, of photography. I think it is phenomenal and, and thank you so much. No words are enough to thank you. Um, all of you here. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I just want to add one thing that people who are watching and who have been through this walkthrough, make sure that once things start improving, which hopefully will be in the next few weeks, make sure you're physically coming to the museum to see it for yourself. I am going to be there on day one. So ten, Tell 10 other people, and I'm talking also to people who will be seeing the recording of this, which will be yes. sitting there on Jesse's channel. Uh, the museum is not, it's not about supporting the museum. It's about owning the museum. If you're a photographer and there's a space which is a house and temple of photography, yes. show your love. Be that. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Yeah, let us just take one last selfie. Um, all smiles, everybody looking into the camera and yeah, so... Thank you. Thank, thank you. you All right. Thank you Good so night. much. And thank you everybody on YouTube as well. And so as uh, Dinesh sir uh, just said that the moment it opens and if you have, is it possible if you are nearby, just visit, just spread the word, be there. It's a temple of photography. I am going to be there on, on its first day of reopening. And I, that's, that's certain. Probably that will be my first time that I'll even venture out of my house. Um, I've not gone out anywhere. So I think that is the first thing that I'm going and to do. I have to get Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, good night. Good night, sir. Thanks, everyone. Bye.